Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Wes Leonard. Um, Wes was a student here at Miami University, grew up here in Oxford, so very, very familiar to this place, and I know many of you are familiar with him. He's now a professor of Native American Studies at Southern Oregon University. The title of his talk is Your Language Isn't Extinct, The Role of Miamia in Language Revitalization. Welcome, welcome home, Wes. <clears throat> Nice introduction. Te Paka Neola Kokoke, Nungi Shai Pawe. It's good to see you uh, this morning. Very pleased to be here. I want to just start by telling you a little bit about my own background as a way of grounding my talk. My participation in Miamia language reclamation began about 15 years ago and became very significant around 2003 at which point I was beginning the major research phase in my graduate training in linguistics at the University of California, Berkeley. At that point, I began formally researching Miami language acquisition patterns, language development issues, community needs and interests, and did so in the context of what has since become a much larger research program. Primarily, or generally speaking, I investigate the hows and the whys of Native American language reclamation efforts, including that of Miamia. And I also examine the ways in which academic fields, such as linguistics, are part of these processes. Today's talk grew out of reflection that I did regarding what I've observed over the years with respect to the story of Miamia language reclamation, both by the characters within the story and also by those who've told this story to others or have referenced one of its components as an example. Over these years, I've given approximately 25 professional presentations about Miamia at various conferences, workshops, university symposia. And most of these have talked about various points of Miamia reclamation itself, that is, the hows and the whys of this particular story. Today, I'll be speaking to you about a related but different uh, story, one that has been present for some time, but has, for the most part, been discussed only by non Miamia people. That issue is the question of how these high hows and whys of the Miamia case have come to influence theories of language reclamation more generally and practices of language reclamation more generally. And my goal for today's short presentation is to provide you with a perspective that mixes an outsider lens with an insider perspective, specifically the lens of linguistics as an academic discipline mixed with my perspectives as both a member of that field as a linguist and also as a tribal member and language learner. But before I get into this, let me take a moment to clarify what exactly I mean by my presentation's title. I'll talk about the first part at the end of my talk, but let me talk about the second, the role of Miamia in language reclamation. When I say Miamia, I'm referring to the language called Miamia, in English Miami or Miami, Illinois, and also to the people who claim and speak that language, to the Miamiake. You know, in our language, the word Miamia refers both to the language and to the people. And as for the term language reclamation, this gets used by different, differently by different people, so let me clarify my own usage. Most scholars use the term language revitalization to discuss the process by which a language comes back into use or into increased use through some sort of purposeful intervention. When I say language reclamation, however, I'm going beyond revitalization to include something that entails a community's recognition and assertion of the right and ability to learn, use, categorize, and establish goals with respect to their language. In other words, language reclamation entails the revitalization of the language itself, but also the recognition of the right to do that in the first place and to do it in a way that reflects community needs. That noted, the story of Miamia language reclamation has become many things. Here are some of them. It's now a widely referenced case study of language reclamation without speakers, that is from a situation in which there were no speakers originally. 
become an example that challenges and helps to refine previous ideas about language endangerment, documentation, and reclamation. And it's a model and an inspiration. I don't need to say too much about that last one. I'm trying to turn it off. I'm sorry. I was trying to turn oh. it off. We'll just do it in the Miami language and it'll be good. <laughs> and so I'm going to share with you three lessons that I've extrapolated from my investigations over the years. These are lessons that have not been fully adopted within the larger world of linguistics as a discipline, but that have nevertheless made significant inroads. And they all reflect you know, wisdom that's come out of of uh, interactions that I've had with other Miamia people and with other linguists. Lesson one, and perhaps the most important one, is this. Sleeping language reclamation is possible, and we should challenge the E word. OK, so there are two terminology issues here, so let me briefly mention those, explain those. One is the term sleeping, which I'll get to in a bit, and the other is the E word. Well, I'll just tell you what it is. The word is extinct. Okay, the E word is extinct, and we've come to refer to it as the E word uh, as a way of distancing ourselves from that term. Not from the word itself so much, but rather from a very specific and inappropriate usage of it, which I'll get to momentarily. This stems from a general idea that had developed in linguistics over the years that's summarized here, which is that language endangerment, that is the threat of a given language going out of use or of being marginalized, represents a continuum of sorts, where there's some languages represented here on the left that are not endangered, that is, where everybody speaks them and recognizes them and legitimizes them. And then there are languages that would be represented here on the right that might be said to be highly endangered, that are in threat of going out of use or of being marginalized, or both. And I'm saying then on the left, under this general continuum that's been put forth by a number of linguists, we would find so-called healthy languages associated with powerful countries or groups. English, American English, would be one variety. And to the right of that might be languages with you know, very wide or very large speaker populations, but that are not associated with a powerful country per se. To the right of that is a term that I don't particularly like, but that's used in the literature, which is moribund. A moribund language is defined as one that has living speakers, but is not actively being learned by children in the home. In other words, it has speakers now, but unless something happens, it's going to go out of use when those speakers pass away. And then there are so-called extinct languages. Now notice that there are no arrows pointing to the line here, the continuum, because extinct is out of the realm of endangered. It's just gone. And as this term has been used over the years, this is the only definition I could come up with that encompasses the whole thing. Any and every language that isn't known by anybody or that went through a period where nobody knew it. It's very, very problematic because languages such as Miamia were called extinct, even when people were speaking it again. It was in response to this that I proposed a different way of considering language endangerment. Referenced, yes, there is a continuum. There still is a continuum where some languages are less endangered and some are more endangered. And on the left, again, we have languages such as the standard American English, widely spoken prestigious languages associated with powerful groups and with a lot of institutionalized backing. And then moving on, I replace the term moribund with a phrase, languages that are not intergenerationally transmitted. So it gets away from that death metaphor, but rather just describes the situation for what it is. And I propose a new category called sleeping languages. This was not my term. It was one that was already being used by a portion of Miamia people and by indigenous people elsewhere to reference languages that had gone completely out of use, but that had, if you will, reclamation potential in that they had a heritage community and existed in some sort of documentation from which they could be learned. My argument at the time, and this was something I presented six years ago at the Miamia conference, was that sleeping languages need to be considered within these categorizations and that they are you know, languages of interest to linguists. And indeed, there are truly extinct languages, ones that are irretrievably lost, that don't exist in documentation, that nobody knows about, that existed maybe thousands and thousands of years ago. And they, again, are, are not part of this continuum. But, but that's um, not what I'm talking about today. 
So why is this important? Well, some of you have seen this slide before, or have heard the idea before, which is that most linguists, when we look up a given language online or in a reference material, will consult what's called the ethnologue. The ethnologue is a book and also a website that attempts to catalog all of the languages known in the world. By known, I mean known to Western science. And so right now they have just under 7,000 languages for which they give basic demographic information, including their linguistic affiliations, the areas in which they're spoken, and estimates about their speaker population. And so just until a few years ago, this is from the 14th edition of the Ethnologue, Miamia people, myself included, would look up our language and this is what we would see. Miami, an extinct language of USA. Notice that this was still true at the time when Miami language reclamation efforts had been significantly underway, at which point many people were using the Miamia language in various realms, and at which point the term extinct, which probably was never appropriate, was certainly no longer accurate. So I pointed this out to a number of other linguists, and it has now been more, it's now more recognized that sleeping language reclamation, that is a reclamation of languages with no speakers, is possible and needs to be formally acknowledged. And I've represented that here by talking about Miamia, or placing, excuse me, Miamia on this continuum, and that it used to be a sleeping language, is now a formerly sleeping language because it has a speaker population, and keeps getting less and less endangered as these reclamation efforts continue. I pointed this out directly to the eth editor of the Ethnologue. I literally went up to him at a conference and I said, hello, Paul. <laughs> I don't think that this term extinct is appropriate. And I wanted to share with you the results of that discussion, which also entailed some back and forth email and I think wider discussions among other people. This is a current entry from the Ethnologue for Miamia. Notice what it doesn't say anymore. It says Miami a language of the United States. In the previous version, where it said language use, it used the term extinct. Now it just says, you know, some know a few words and phrases, revitalization program in progress, no L1, that is first language speakers, as of 1996. Arguably, there are some, at least semi-speakers, first language speakers today, but it's true that there weren't any of 1996. So this still needs a little bit of updating. But what's important about this is the word that's missing and the ways in which linguistics as a discipline has come to recognize the validity of languages such as Miamia and the problematic nature of lumping languages that are not spoken together you know, under the rubric of extinct. Because then we come to a situation when some languages are more extinct than others. This term sleeping, or the idea of sleeping, has also taken off you know, in much of the literature. Here's one example. This comes from a book called Reawakening Languages, Theory and Practice in the Revitalization of Australia's Indigenous Languages. It's a 2010 publication. This is from the editor's introduction. As editors, we preferred to keep a loose rein on content. However, we were rather insistent about some terminology, especially to eschew terms like moribund, dead, and extinct. Such terms, as applied to their languages, are most often offensive to indigenous peoples and are avoided in favor of terms like sleeping, for example, Leonard 2008. And I didn't just pick this because it cited me, uh, <laughs> but rather because it represented a pattern. And it's true that, yes, Leonard 2008 was a publication that put this idea forward, but the real example itself comes from the Miamia community as a whole. I was just the one who formalized it in that particular publication. The editors beyond this go on to write, in any case, it seems absurd to continue with such labels for languages that may now have hundreds of speakers as a result of language revitalization efforts. Indeed, it is absurd. That term sleeping has also taken off in various other places in which I work, one of those being California. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of examples of formerly sleeping languages and these I've chosen because the communities in question have adopted that term sleeping and have really used the Miamia case as an example, as a model for themselves. 
So one of them is the Tongva Nation, which is uh, indigenous to the Los Angeles bas Basin. In here we see uh, Tongva, a formerly language, a sleeping language of California, being used in the Hokey Pokey. Um, so I have it translated here in English, put your right foot in, put your right foot out. But of course, they were doing this in Tongva, which is not an extinct language. And another example that comes out of California, again, one that has widely referenced the Miamia case as an example, is that of Mutsun, which is another formerly sleeping language of California. And here you see an example where they were using that so-called extinct language uh, to do a contemporary translation of green eggs and ham. Uh, unfortunately, I can't read it to you in their language because I don't speak it, but, but you can trust me that it exists. So that's lesson one. We can challenge the E word. Here's lesson two. Documentation should look toward the future. By documentation, I refer to any kind of systematic discovery, any kind of systematic writing down, taping, etc., of language you know, for some sort of archival purpose. And as part of this, there's been a lot of discussion in linguistics about what are called best practices. So how should we do documentation? What are the best ways to keep that documentation? Where do we store the archives? What kind of paper do we use? With whom do we work? And so on. Well, these best practices have been evolving very significantly in the field of linguistics, with the Miamia case being one of the instigators to some of those changes. The older paradigm is known as salvage linguistics, basically, you know, documenting stuff before it goes away. And this also gets used in anthropology and earlier forms of anthropology, salvage anthropology. This documenting for science before languages are lost. We need to get out there. These languages are going away. We need this stuff for science. And so we're going to write it all down. Well, and there are various good things that come out of that. The scientific interest under this paradigm is geared more toward languages themselves, towards the grammars, and less toward the social functions of those languages. Moreover, grants, granting agencies that have been participating in this paradigm, tend to focus on documenting dying languages. So a language that's spoken right now, but that is thought to, is predicted to not be spoken at some point soon in the future, is very, very high priority. And again, rightly so, because you know, that type of research is important, but it's problematic in the message that it might send. Now we have a newer paradigm, which extends the former, it doesn't replace the former, it extends the former to add ongoing comprehensive documentation with an eye toward language reclamation, saying, OK, so we're documenting this stuff, but how might that be used in the future or even at the present for purposes of reclamation? So it changes the type of documentation as well as the idea of who it should go for. This includes documentation of reclamation practices. So the reclamation itself is now worthy of documentation, worthy of being studied and understood. This also recognizes the needs and the expertise of all stakeholders. So it's no longer a top-down model, but rather one that recognizes that multiple players, the community itself, researchers who work with the community, and so on, all have a, play, a role to play. So here's an example of documentation of revitalization. Or rather, this is an example of documentation of documentation of revitalization. So we have a video being taken here of a reclamation, cultural reclamation activity, and then I took a picture of that. It's uh, sort of like the old joke about going into a Starbucks and finding another Starbucks inside. In any case, this is Yasuo Sawa here, who is one of the filmmakers who produced our documentary, Miamia e Mamwachike. I wanted to reference this one. If you have not seen it, it's for sale outside in the lobby. Uh, because this is a documentary about language reclamation in the Miamia community. And it's one that's very, very widely referenced in the community of linguists and uh, practitioners with an interest in language reclamation. But also on the notion of documentation, I wanted to share with you an example that Daryl Baldwin and I were both involved in very significantly this uh, past summer, which is the 2011 11 Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages, which was a two-week workshop that was held last June in Washington, DC. This was a workshop that was focused on use of archival materials, so documentation, for reclamation purposes. It was a workshop that explicitly recognized the role that documentation could play in reclamation, and so making that link in a formal way. 
Uh, this workshop, this institute, included particip participants from communities with sleeping languages. So again, recognizing, yeah, no, languages that don't have speakers can still gain speakers, and the documentation plays a role in that. But most important was that this institute was supported by a major grant, over $150,000, from the Documenting Endangered Languages Program, which is the National Science Foundation program. This is noteworthy because, again, under the old paradigm, the idea was that grants were very, very available for languages that had not gone out of use, especially those that were not widely documented, because it was understood as to why they would be important for science. Now we have an agency documenting endangered languages, a program that's giving monies or granting monies to communities that are using documentation or that are even creating documentation of reclamation. So a very, very different Way, line of thinking. The Miamia, uh, Miamia case has been very prominent in that. And I was pleased uh, to hear last night uh, that the Miamia community has now been awarded a Documenting Endangered Languages Program grant of over $120,000. And we just heard about this, what, 36 hours ago, approximately. And so the legacy continues. Finally, lesson three, language communities evolve. This should be obvious, but sometimes it's not, to linguists. And ideas about their cultural and linguistic legitimacy should be informed by the past, present, and future identities and needs of their members. Or to put this in more straightforward terms, Miamia people are not locked in space and time. We evolve. That's a good thing. The academic world gets that to a degree that it didn't before. We're not just locked in the past, and neither is our language. So in the context of language reclamation specifically, what this means is that linguistics as a discipline now better recognizes that language reclamation is not about reenacting the past and the languages that existed at some point, but rather about moving forward in a way that incorporates the wisdom of the past and the language itself and continually evolves via reflection on changing community needs. I want to share with you an example of somebody who didn't get this. This is from 2007, a blog comment by a sociolinguist who said, I give the revival of the Miamia language a 1% chance of being successful, and that is being optimistic. There are a number of problems with this uh, statement, you know, in addition to the fact that it's um, not really accurate. Is that decisions about the appropriate target of language reclamation were often, or too often, driven by structural linguistics. In other words, where people were defining successful reclamation as entailing the use of the, uh, the fluency of the entire community using grammatical constructions that were the same as the ones that existed at some point in the past. And it's very different from my idea of reclamation and the idea of reclamation that's been put forth by Miamia language efforts, just one that's much, much broader and that isn't all about grammar, or isn't all about fluency. Nevertheless, it's not entirely sure what this individual was thinking of. Rather, he just made a very dire prediction and did so without ever having asked the Miamia community what it is that we're even trying to do. And that brings me to the next point, again, in the context of this lesson, which is that legitimacy should be informed by the past, present, and future identities and needs of the community members. I want to raise to you a question. You know, have Miamia language reclamation efforts been successful? So have they been successful? Well, the short answer is ihia, yes. Uh, but in terms of the influence of the Miami story on language reclamation practices and theory, there's actually a much more important answer. The answer is this one. Success must be defined in the context of community needs and practices. This is a point that has been shared again and again and again by members of the Miamia community and our allies. And it's one that's really starting to take off, now widely referenced in the literature and in practices associated with language reclamation. Our goals are not immediate fluency. Our goals are not you know, exact recreation of some sort of grammatical structure, although, of course, understanding historical grammatical structure is important. Rather, the goal lies more in cultural connection, community binding and building, healing from various atrocities of the past, and creating healthy ideologies about language 
so that Miamia children, who will later become Miamia adults, will view themselves as potential agents in this process and recognize that they can speak Miamia because it's their language and that somebody else, especially somebody who's never consulted with a community, isn't, doesn't, isn't really in the place to make such predictions in the first place. It gives us a language, it gives us an agency to respond to those sorts of things. Now to share with you a quick case study of this effect, this is a discussion that I had with Jared Baldwin, who was 14 at the time, but who's much older now, but still equally intelligent. And I was talking to him about the language use and acquisition of his younger siblings, the older of whom now is 15 as of today. <laughs> so happy birthday to her. And I said to him, as the older sibling, what do you think would be the best for your younger siblings in terms of being raised with the Miamia language or having their schooling in more than one language? And he said, I think it gives them a different point of view on, on the world today. And it gives them something more social. They can do more within a social group, like teach, teach others to use it. Notice what isn't here is some sort of notion of fluency or of recreation of grammatical structure or reenacting the past. Rather, it's about building relationships and taking a role in the community and recognizing the role of one person who has a certain type of wisdom to pass that on to somebody else. Those are all parts of reclamation. And I say, you know, these are the sorts of issues that we need to be looking at. Also on the theme of not reenacting the past, some of you have seen this slide before. This is rehearsing for a puppet show, Little Red Riding Hood, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Fox? So of course, Fox, Papangamwa is our tricksters. So we had to change, uh, change the character from wolf to fox for the Miamia version. But a number of years ago, something like this, even though it would be seen as cute by a number of linguists, was somewhat challenged, where people would say, well, Little Red Riding Hood isn't a Miami story. And they're not really speaking Miamia in the same way that their ancestors did. And well, to be frank, they don't really look Miami because Indians are supposed to look like something else, even though I don't really know any Miami people, I'm gonna make that kind of prediction. We see these sorts of things again and again. And those are, to a much larger degree, being challenged today, again, I think, because of the uh, efforts of Miamia people to share our story and to get it out there and to just be Miamia in the various ways that we are, which includes you know, direct Miami ancestry, but also includes the various other communities that we're all members of. So I'm running out of time here. So in conclusion, I'd like to return to my first slide and explain the context underlying the title of this talk, the first part of which was, your language isn't extinct. There's actually a quotation. It goes like this, your language isn't extinct. I know because I can understand you. So this was something that was said to me uh, approximately three years ago when I was in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, participating in a panel, the English name of which was Unifying Diverse Communities for Language Revitalization. It had a Hawaiian name too. And so what it was, and I wish that I could remember the exact details to share with you, but I, I can't, so I'll just give you the general overview, just that I said something in the Miamia language at the beginning of my talk. And then I went on to make the point about sleeping languages and how they're legitimate and whatnot, and how the Miamia language is not extinct. Well, a gentleman in the audience came up to me after the talk and said this to me, your language isn't extinct, I know, because I can understand you. Clearly, this was a speaker of some other related language. So Miamia is relatively close to other Algonquian languages, not really mutually intelligible, but close enough so that for a shorter phrase or for a few words, people can get the basic idea of what the other person is saying. I'm sorry to say I did not confirm exactly who this person was or what his language background was. So I'm making a number of assumptions there. But this was very, very empowering to me because it reflected you know, somebody else, somebody who clearly was a speaker of one of these languages making this comment really made me think about the ongoing interplay between a given community and the wider world. Even with a lesson that success must be defined in the context of community needs and practices, it's not the case that what we do within the Miamia language community is or should be devoid of outside evaluation. Rather, the comments of others are essential because they add to our own perspectives and help us keep doing what we do well uh, and to improve whatever we're not doing well. This example also drives home the point of this talk, 
which is that what we as Miyamiyake do in our own language and cultural reclamation efforts very much affects the outside world. And so I'll end this talk with a call for all of us to continue to work hard on these efforts so that they can continue to serve as a positive model for others. Okay. Mishinewe, thank you. Okay, so I went a little over time, as I always do, but I have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, Dolph. Uh, well, so how has this new paradigm of mm -hmm. which absolutely makes a ton of sense, um, uh, informed uh, granting agencies like ANA Category 1, where you have to try to fund it to hire linguists to, are these linguists familiar with this enough that they Right. So I can't talk you know, too publicly about you know, various you know, sort of professional work that I've done. A lot of times, as many of you know, you know academics get asked to, uh, to peer review uh, grant applications and things like that. And usually we need to do that anonymously, or we can't say so-and-so is applying for this and this is what they said. But I can just give you in a more general sense. I've done quite a bit of this. The term sleeping is now widely used. The Miamia case is very widely referenced and more and more of these grants. Used to be that they were about science first, and then they were about science and the community. And they're about the community and science. And as I was saying, they're very, very much now recognizing, recognizing the validity of work on sleeping languages. Because again, under the old paradigm, you know, languages that had speakers, they were the focus, they were the focus. And now they are a focus, and languages such as Miamia are another focus. Yeah, so, yeah, so the effect has been very large. OK, so maybe one other question. Yes. Uh, it's a lovely talk. Thank you. Anyway. Um, at some point, you switched from the term revitalization to reclamation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if that was just, is there really any distinguishing between those two terms? So. Right, so again, there's my term reclamation. What I was doing throughout the rest of the talk when I used the term revitalization, so I was trying to start with reclamation and then occasionally go back to revitalization. Uh, when I was quoting somebody, or when I was referring to an idea that somebody else has, had put forth, I was using the term that they used. Sometimes you also see regeneration and revival. I think with all of these terms, what's really important is for people to define exactly what they mean. Uh, because people do use them differently. But certainly, for me, when I'm saying reclamation, I'm talking not just about doing stuff with the language itself, but also the wider social context in which that happens. Re you know, recognizing the right, articulating that right, and challenging silly ideas that sometimes other people still unfortunately say about our language. So, so I think I'm out of time for real, so anyway. <laughs>